Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I take immense pleasure in welcoming you all for the flagship research conference, Athenium 2020, the International Management Research Conference, hosted by Bharti Dasan Institute of Management, Trishra Pally. Athenium is a research conference organized by the Center for Contemporary Management Research, the research wing of BIM Trichy, with a view to promote academic value in the management practice. This conference is distinct from other typical academic conferences as Athenium aims to take contemporary research into management practice and vice versa. It is a privilege to be in the presence of such eminent speakers and get to hear their insights. And I thank you all for joining us today on this special event. The theme for the first panel of the day is Disruptive Innovation and Transformation. Competing in the marketplace through disruptive innovation is the globally acclaimed management practice today and will extend all over the business world. Serving the needs of different markets globally in a substantially superior way, adapting to local preferences, standards and culture is therefore an intimidating channel challenge. Added to this, the emerging global trade risks and constraints makes the disruptive innovation challenge even more complex. Though the culture of transforming to disruptive innovation by aspiring global businesses is prevalent, accommodating globalization under emerging trade constraints is a new dimension of business transformation. With this brief introduction on the theme, I would like to start uh, introduce the chair of the panel, Professor Elizabeth Rose. Professor Elizabeth Rose holds the chair in international business at the University of Leeds. She is also an adjunct professor of business policy and strategy at the Indian Institute of Management, Udaipur. She has the honor of being an elected fellow of the Academy of International Business and received the 2019 Women of the Year Award. Professor Elizabeth Rose authored the book International Business Strategy Perspectives on Implementation in Emerging Markets and has published 50 journal articles and numerous conference papers across multiple fields. Her recent research paper was published in the Journal of Small Business Management about process innovation in small and medium-sized enterprises. I welcome you, ma'am. Next, I welcome Mr. Samantari, who is a Group Chief Marketing Officer at Narayana Health. He is part of the core leadership team at Narayana Health and is directly responsible for sales, marketing, shared services, pricing, and international markets. He is an alumnus of Indian School of Business in Hyderabad and Goa Institute of Management. Mr. Sumanta was rated among the top 50 most influential marketing leaders in India in 2017 and top 50 most talented CMOs in India in 2014. Mr. Sumanta, for the love of interacting with ignited young minds, has been teaching across various B schools, which includes IIM Bangalore and Goa Institute of Management. I welcome you, sir. Thank with you, great sir. Good to be here. With with great delight, I also welcome Mr. Srinivas Dagam, who is a Consulting Senior Practice Director at Oracle Financial Services. He is a techno-functionally sophisticated and growth-centric management professional with rich experience in consulting, banking transformation programs, development projects, implementation management, integration, and management of end-to-end -end banking solutions across the globe. He is also an alumnus of Ben Trichy. I welcome you, sir. I yeah, heartily thanks, sir. Welcome, sir. I heartily welcome all the panelists and participants. If the participants have any questions during the session or post the session, please post it in the chat box. We will take up it towards the end. I request the chair of the panel, Professor Elizabeth Rose, to take the discussion forward. Over to you, ma'am. Thank you so much, Shinas. Welcome, ma'am. Um, okay, I'm delighted to be here, even though it's really early where I am and I'm not a morning person. Um, but I think this panel, based on our discussion yesterday, is going to be sufficiently exciting that it's going to keep us all very much on the edge of our seats. And that is not down to me, but we have two marvelous guest speakers. Um, so basically, the brief plan for our session is that I'll give a very short introduction. Um, then we have a short video to set the scene. Um, we have remarks from our two wonderful industry panelists who are both very, very bright and with fascinating experience. And we'll spend most of the time having a discussion about this fascinating topic. And then we have, we're, we're hoping to have lots of time for Q&A. So please make sure to type your questions into the chat function. 
So basically, if we think about um, what is disruptive innovation, this is essentially it's it's work that what that's that's very much attributed to Professor Clayton Christensen um, at Harvard Business School, but he did a lot of the early work with Professor Joseph Bauer, also at Harvard Business School, who also did a lot of work on mergers and acquisitions. So these are both very smart people. Um, essentially. We think of, of disruptive innovation as an innovation that creates essentially a brand new market. It disrupts the existing situation and, and most likely displaces established market leaders. So it's, it's changing the nature of the game. So it may transform, for example, a previously really, really expensive product into one that's very widely affordable and accessible. Um, you guys are mostly too young to remember what before lap before personal computers and laptops. It used to be that a university would have one ginormous computer. And in order to go and when I was in my doing my PhD, in order to, to do my analysis, I would have to take a stack of cards, computer cards, which I had carefully typed in, run them through the, the card reader, hope and pray that there were no typos and a few hours later get my output. It was not a civilized time computing wise. And then there was this transformation and suddenly people could get very expensive and not very powerful, but home computers. And now my phone is like vastly better than any computer I had for the first 10 years of my career. But this, this was disruptive innovation, this notion that computing could go from being a, a machine taking a machine that took up more space than my apartment, I have a small apartment, to being something that could sit on my desk. And it changed the, we, the, the people, the companies that were leaders in the field before were not suddenly not leaders, they were quickly displaced. Because what we find is that market leaders are just not immediately equipped to reach the new, much larger market, for example, this is a huge strategic challenge and involves very new business models. And that's very disruptive to, to firms. Um, I, I'd also argue that though, you know, disruptive innovation is fascinating, um, but not all innov interesting innovation is disruptive. So for example, there's work by uh, Vijay Govindarajan and Rami Ramamurti, Ravi Ramamurti um, and reverse innovation, and that's where products develop to meet needs in developing markets, then spread and are very successful in developed markets. That's an interesting aspect of innovation to look at. There's this notion of product versus process innovation. We typically think in terms of flash new products, um, but process innovation is also quite fascinating. I've, we've just resubmitted a paper on that, so that's in the top of my head. Um, and most innovation is actually not a big flash, it's incremental, but that's still extremely important to businesses. Um, there's the notion of open innovation um, by Henry Chesbro, and that's basically looking at accessing in ideas from outside the innovation. And that gets us to thinking more about networks and partnerships among businesses. And innovation that occurs in the face of real challenges and barriers the paper we just submitted earlier this week is is about how Iranian firms, for example, managed to in, managed to implement open innovation despite the fact that technically speaking, they're not allowed to be talking to be uh, dealing with firms outside of Iran due to international sanctions. So there are lots of fascinating questions we can we can touch on here. Um, okay, we have a video. That three of us found. Um, it's, is somebody from the host institution running that? I hope. Yeah, yeah we could get that going. Uh, Thank you. To kick off that discussion. <laughs> thanks, thanks, Matt. Navigating three minutes, guys. can be challenging for established companies. I want to help you understand the life cycle of disruption and the actions you can take at each stage to survive. Mm -hmm. 
Please go ahead. It's good. Navigating digital disruption can be challenging for established companies. I want to help you understand the life cycle of disruption and the actions you can take at each stage to survive and even thrive in the digital age. Here's a typical company growth curve. As the business matures, the early willingness to experiment gives way to standardization. It focuses on doing more of what works and generating consistent cash flow to support growth. But as we'll see, the strengths that help a company become an incumbent tend to become weaknesses when disruption hits. Disruption introduces a new business model that's at odds with your current one. At this early stage of disruption, you're struggling to figure out what's real and what's hype. There's barely any effect on your core business. You're still making money, so you don't feel the need to act. At this stage, incumbents aren't looking for and sometimes don't want to see the dangers on the horizon. The biggest challenge here is myopia. It takes rare foresight and a lot of courage to make a preemptive move and change your business model at this stage. And that move will often face resistance from your stakeholders. Still, it's vital here to challenge your own story about how your industry makes money. It takes acuity, a particular sharpness of vision to do this. By now, the trend is clear. Successful newcomers have validated the new business model. Action at this point is critical. You need to nurture new ventures in the emerging business model. And these initiatives need autonomy from your core business, even if they cannibalize it. The idea is to act before you have to. The problem though, is that it still doesn't feel like you need to do anything. Your earnings are still growing. The vague threat just doesn't seem as dangerous as immediate hardship. After all, when Netflix disrupted itself in 2011 by shifting from DVDs to streaming, its share price dropped by over 80%. Few boards are willing to endure that kind of pain. But by this stage, the industry is moving rapidly to the new model, which has proven superior to the old. You'll start feeling the squeeze in the results. It's time to hit the gas. You need to accelerate your transformation by aggressively shifting resources to the new ventures. Think of it as treating these new businesses like venture capital investments that only pay off if they scale rapidly, while the old ones are subject to a private equity style workout. Now that is an incredibly tough shift for incumbents to make, especially when the forces of disruption are reducing the overall cash flow available. Performance will suffer, and the natural inclination is to cut back on peripheral activities and focus on your core legacy business. The problem is, you may no longer have a core legacy business. The disruptive model has become the new normal. Whether you like it or not, your industry has fundamentally changed. If you haven't taken action, your cost base is likely out of whack with your industry's new business model. Your earnings are diving, and you're poorly positioned to become a market leader. The only thing to do is adapt or exit the business, with the hard reality being that the glory days of your industry may be behind you. Now, that sounds gloomy, but the overall message here is positive. Companies that show foresight and a willingness to make bold moves before it's too late can emerge as winners. After all, no one ever won a race by standing still. guys for showing that um and this is pretty best for finding that because i think it sums up what we're going to be talking about today really really well um I'd like to now call on my co-panelists to give you a bit of background for for what they're doing and um sorry i'm not showing my slides now right hopefully <laughs> um so um Trinibas, do you want to, to get us started? Yeah, talk yeah, a little absolutely. Bit about your wonderful experience in this field. Yeah, yeah, sure, sure. Thanks a lot, uh, Beth, for the introduction and playing the video. Thanks a lot. So I would like to uh, talk about uh, myself while connecting to this uh, video we have just seen. Uh, because I really believe this uh, jumping the car, it's called the sigmoid car. Uh, and uh, jumping the car from one uh, uh -huh. projection sort of or uh, one uh, layer of uh, comfort or one forecast sort of to get on to the next wave sort of so 
I, I'll start by explaining about my own uh, career, sort, sort of, if I may. So I, I am a mechanical engineer, started off as a mechanical engineer, and uh, I think things were uh, pretty smooth, and uh, there was a straight path ahead of me, maybe 10% growth or 5% growth ahead of me per annum, and that's where I was. And uh, due to whatever reason, uh, to get on to the next curve, maybe next growth phase, sort of, I went on to do MBA. So I am alumnus of this uh, campus, BIM Trichy, and uh, I'm honored to be a panelist and talking to you guys also right now. Uh, sorry, I have. As, um, from the audience, please make sure that your microphones are muted. Yeah, thank you, thank you. So I, I was talking about my own uh, case, um, where I jumped from my management uh, engineering uh, curve sort of, or wave sort of, to a management wave. Sorry, could all uh, audience uh, go on mute, please? Thank you, thank you. So I, after my MBA, I got into a, again, uh, what was supposed to be a hot field at uh, that point of time for finance professionals, sort of, which was uh, getting into an NBFC. This was in the 95. And uh, for four years, uh, it was good going, uh, exactly like the curve that was shown until disruption hit our sector in the industry. So what happened was uh, uh, due to some external factors, sort of, the whole industry got uh, wiped out almost overnight. So around 40, 45,000 NBFCs were shut down almost overnight in uh, 99 sort of. So suddenly you you may be the only um, one or two companies left uh, in the industry sort of, and that's not a good place to be. In. So that that's that, that's what happened at that point of time, and uh, I had switched my career at that uh, point of time again. So I, I was still in the same uh, financial services sector. Uh, doing credit rating, okay. Uh, but then I was slightly worried of uh, getting into the IT curve, which was the huge, huge, uh, I'm sure a lot of people, uh, at least the older generations would know about Y2K. Uh, so that was a really big thing in this part of the world. So everybody is learning uh, uh, IBM, something uh, to do with mainframes to, and, uh, learn anything and everything and get onto the IT bandwagon and move to the US or some, anywhere else to fix the Y2K problem sort of. So somehow I had resisted that and um, stuck to credit rating industry. Uh, and then there was uh, this dot-com bust. I, I'll talk about this uh, a little later, uh, I'm sure. But then um, there, there is uh, so much scare that uh, although IT is such a booming field, there are a lot of cases of, uh, how to say, uh, boom to bus cycles already, thanks to the dot-com bus. So I was very hesitant to join a very good uh, uh, job offer I got from the company I which, uh, for which I work now, Oracle Financial Services. So they were a global product already in core banking. Uh, I was very hesitant to join, but then I kicked myself into it. And I'm very glad uh, for the kick. <laughs> Kick off sort of I gave myself because uh, 20 years on uh, it's been a real growth path. So I have worked in more than 30 countries across the globe in this 20 years, and uh, a really fascinating and uh, exciting journey all over. But uh, why I had belabored this point of my own career was that uh, at each point of time you would already be uh, comfortable in a position of. Uh, uh, position and then you might not be looking forward to kicking yourself into a new risky uh, position sort of but then uh, exactly when you are comfortable and things seems to be rosy that's the time to rethink um, where you want to go who are you and uh, I think that that's a very important uh, question even for corporates especially the bigger ones so this theme uh, is uh, very central to what we are doing um, as an organization as well. And uh, uh, so the growth mindset is uh, very, very key in here. So I, I pass on the baton to Sumantha right now so with this brief introduction from my own side. 
Thanks, Srinivas. Uh, uh, thanks for the wonderful introduction, Beth. I think uh, it set the context properly. Uh, so taking a cue from Srinivas, uh, let me just uh, tell a little uh, few words about my career and uh, disruption innovation, whichever way you look at it, uh, how, how it, it I kind of it crossed my path some, sometimes, if not all the time. Uh, so, like Srinivas mentioned, when uh, you know around the time he went to business school, I also was in business school, uh, and of course, like Beth mentioned earlier, earlier that it was the pre-information age, so we didn't have any information. Mm -hmm. So, uh, the only information I knew was that uh, the most hot career options are in finance, right? Uh, which is what Srinivas has touched upon briefly. So I said, okay, I want to be a finance MBA. So I joined MBA. First a few quizzes, and I realized that if I stick with finance, there's a very strong chance I may not graduate. Okay, because <laughs> suddenly I, I got hit by a wall reading. Um, I, I used to think there used to be a magazine that those days called Business Today, and I used to subscribe yeah. to it. So I then realized reading Business Today is not equal to solving a financial matter. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I was slightly concerned about myself and I thought, okay, I have now relocated, got into a hostel, uh, you know, spent a lot of my dad's money and now what? And suddenly, uh, of course, I started getting very interested in marketing and that, that kind of came organically. So I realized, okay, this seems to be one uh, way out, one path to sal salvation. So I kind of uh, graduated out and um, I got into advertising. So I, I worked in, in five, six years in advertising, uh, worked uh, in quite a few, uh, on a few leading brands. Uh, but then like Srinivas again mentioned that uh, you have to kick yourself before uh, somebody else kicks you. Um, so, and I did not want to get into the situation of uh, what happened uh, when I suddenly realized finance was not business today. So I was kind of thinking that, look, I am I'm so far so good. I'm not really exceptional at advertising, uh, but uh, so what could I do and what do I love? So I, I, I am a huge movie buff, right? And um, what, what uh, the graph uh, that was shown earlier, the S curve, the one thing I took out from it, they mentioned Netflix. So uh, it, it was very happy. <laughs> so I said, look, I, I, know, I, I understand movies, so I, I like movies. So let me get into the movie business. So I, I joined a startup called Inox, uh, which wow. is India's probably the largest multiplex chain, chain in uh, right now. Uh, so at that point of time, uh, we were part of that revolution, built up Inox as part of the founding team. Uh, one advantage that because I was part of the founding team and a lot of the juniors are now big shots in that organization, I still get free tickets and popcorn at, at any of the Inox. <laughs> so some of the benefits, but then after some time, I said, okay, let me see, uh, can I kick myself again? Um, so movie is done. Yeah, I found it interesting, but really, can I? Um, so I looked at financial services. My old, um, you know, itch about finance and getting wrestled to the ground by uh, our professor UD's papers. Uh, I, you know, I thought, let me just try and see if I can redeem myself. So I, I, I moved on. I moved to life insurance, which is as far from movie industry as as possible. <laughs> so, so I added, uh, you know, marketing for Reliance Life Insurance. So that was the 10th largest player. When I left, it was the second largest player in the country in life insurance. Uh, so some amount of time spent there, understood products, actuary, this, that. Um, after a few years, again, you know, the itch to kick yourself before somebody else kicks you. Uh, and of course, uh, during the when I joined, I, I kind of took the industry down with me. I joined uh, Reliance in 2007, 2008, before, even before I completed one year, the financial crash happened. So everything got, uh, so, so I, I kind of brought amazing amount of luck to the organization uh, in hindsight. So after a few years, I said, okay, uh, let me see what else I can do. Uh, so then I said, okay, uh, let me look at healthcare. Why not healthcare? If I can do movies, if I can do advertising, if I can do financial services, why not healthcare? So 
So then I moved to Apollo and subsequently to NH Narana Health, which I am there right now. Um, so again, um, you know, here I haven't kicked myself too much because <laughs> we have been innovating very fast. So uh, you know, the kicks are more internal than external. Uh, so there it is. So you know, now in healthcare, uh, the 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 underlying theme is, and and this is a very very important thing that. You need to be uh, in, in your career, and this is just a one, one piece of advice because most of the kids uh, are, are now you know, pass out and get into uh, the real world. Uh, it's it's very very important to be insecure. Mm. At, at work, it is, it's, you know your work needs to be secure, but your path to ambition needs to be very very insecure. And unless you have that insecurity, and unless you have that ability to kick yourself hard time to time. Uh, uh, you know, somebody else will kick you. So you have to kick yourself earlier than anybody else kicks you. So that's the mantra. And I, I kind of, uh, this is the brief kind of uh, thing about my career. Um, uh, may not be very worth emulating because of the zigzag, zigzag nature of it. But again, I think the kicking helped. So, yeah. So that's about it. Uh, uh, in terms of my, this thing, I'll, I'll hand it back to Beth. For, Oh, thanks to both of you. Um, uh, Samantha, the um, sort of the 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 nonlinear career path definitely mm -hmm. resonates with me. I chose my undergrad university so I could study Russian history, and ended wow. up with a degree in civil engineering. Ended up with a PhD in statistics after I was I was about to do a PhD in um, civil engineering and realized I I I love bridges. I think they're gorgeous. I think they're elegant. And I suddenly realized I would never walk on a bridge I had designed. And I thought, <laughs> maybe I shouldn't be teaching this. So I ended up in statistics and then finally found my way to IB, uh, international business. I am, um, and, and it's interesting because it's it it brings up something that Srinivas was 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 talking about too. This there's a, a path dependency to what happens in terms of our own careers, and then and also that organizations which are known for great inertia, especially large organizations, have an incredible path dependency, but there's also a need for an entrepreneurial approach. Otherwise, the younger, more agile, more innovative um, organizations can just sort of wipe us all out. Um, and that that ha I, I can see that in both organizations and, and people. Um, okay, that all made sense to me. I'm not sure it made sense to you guys, but. Anyway, um, okay. So let me. I, we we have a few questions. We've 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 kind of shared among ourselves. So so let's let's go through those. Um, so uh, guys, can I ask you, what are you, you've you've touched on on some of them? But what are some of the big tra disruptive transformations that you've experienced in your field during your career? You know, what what are the ones that have really affected your companies? And it could be any of these companies. And are there insights related to these that you can share with our esteemed audience? Sure. Yeah, I, I, please go, Shrinivas. Yeah. Yeah. Th thanks. I'll take a stab. Try to take a stab at least. <laughs> okay. Uh, okay. Uh, present organization. So this. Uh, the, the, this company had a world class product but 25 back that was uh, on a technology called flat file based technology okay meaning it's a single string of uh, information okay so it's not very uh, scientific or logical in uh, today's uh, uh, view but in those days that was the latest and uh, best and greatest and strongest and mightiest and all that so uh, but uh, with that product uh, they, they were uh, world number one and uh, two uh, every other year uh, but some point of time uh, they jumped on to a rdbms uh, uh, database uh, design sort of a thing so which is from a Flat oh, file goes to a more structured uh, table sort of a thing. So where you can fetch data based on some criteria and uh, it's more, lot more scientific uh, than scalable than a flat file based thing. 
so that that has taken uh, the company for more than a decade okay successfully so again for the next 10 15 years this product has been world number one or two every year and uh, other years sort of and then about uh, five years back it moved on to a next bandwidth so what we call this java and microservices so this is a completely different uh, technology again so this company got into this domain now this is called api based technology sort of so soa based technology and then api based technology so this disruption or um, i don't know if there are not many it people on this panel and uh, and the audience also possibly i, I could give an example of indian example of uh, so the toyota had a phenomenal success with uh, a vehicle suv called uh, uh, qualis so it was such a roaring uh, uh, how to say hit in the market and uh, all the uh, individuals as well as drivers um, as well as organizations would watch by the vehicle qualis as a suv and uh, it had the necessary brand value premium and uh, stability quality you name it uh, everything it it ticked all the boxes and they were doing very 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 good but then suddenly overnight we had seen a new product i think quite more costly than this vehicle call is called innova uh, launched by um, toyota again and uh, it was very clear that they are going to cannibalize colleagues like anything they are going to eat up their own uh, <laughs> brother sort of <laughs> kill uh, sort of so that and it didn't i must admit for me at that point of time it didn't make any sense at all this is stupidity is what i thought at that point of time personally but then time has proven that wow what a great place to be in because after you know what i mean uh, nobody even dares uh, dare go uh, near uh, toyota for many years of, of course after that i think there have been competitors also caught on the game and we have a lot more suvs now in the market than 10 years back but then uh, i quote this example in terms of the need to keep on challenging yourself whether it's an organization or a person so this is an example that was uh, very high on my mind uh vis a vis some other uh, like uh, absolute leaders in their industries like uh, nokia and kodak who uh, and no challenge also like uh, global leaders who have the, the, the number two would be maybe i don't know very 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 distant number two possibly so that that's the leadership position they had but then over a period of time completely lost it completely lost it <laughs> the reason is uh, again purely because of uh, uh, being comfortable in their positions and uh, i read somewhere that actually kodak had invented digital camera long time before it uh, became a market success and all that but they ignored it because it's it's no threat or it's it, it does not uh, make any sense when we are the leader sort of sorry over to you sumanth yeah, thanks uh, so I, um, I'll, I'll try to cite two examples uh, from uh, the companies and the industries where I've been involved in. Uh, so one is, uh, and, and disruptions brought by more by external environments uh, rather than a company or something, and those are more tectonic in nature. Right? Uh, so uh, obviously, uh, this year is the year of the pandemic, right? And um, and nobody had imagined in 2020 this kind of a pandemic would happen. I mean, I, I've, I've attended meetings across organizations for the last two decades about Vision 2020, and uh, I've had, I wish I stored those slides somewhere uh, across <laughs> consultants and McKinsey's and everybody giving Vision 2020. I'm sure nobody thought 2020 uh, would be like this, and it was never <laughs> reflected in that vision. Uh, so how did that impact? So I'll give an example that uh, nowadays uh, post this pandemic and those uh, in the Indian context and, and also probably go globally. Um, but uh, what, what is nowadays very common post the pandemic situation is uh, teleconsultation or what we call video consultation. So now people are used to consulting a doctor on the video, right? Uh, 
Uh, it is because people are fearful of going to the hospital. You can't you know, indefinitely postpone your ailments, right? And um, uh, you know, people are now doing it. Now, the very ironical thing is that this technology was available to all healthcare people for the last 20 years, right? Early 2000s. We had a telemedicine department where we, in, in our hospitals, uh, we would do some rural CSR work. Um, people were not interested, companies were not interested, and the regulatory framework was also not clear. Nobody knew uh, whether you, if, if you're doing video consultation and not, not doing a face-to-face, -face, will it fall foul of the mm -hmm. medical legal regulatory framework? So there was confusion, but the, but the technology was there. Everybody knew. Suddenly the pandemic happened. Now the pandemic happened 23rd of March, if, I, if I'm getting my uh, dates right, our prime minister came on TV and said lockdown. <laughs> 24th, the Niti Aayog, the planning commission passed out the telemedicine guideline and it was formulated on 25th of March. The telemedicine guideline got rolled out, right? After two decades of not doing anything, right? Suddenly, there was a telemedicine guideline. Suddenly, customers wanted telemedicine. Suddenly, hospitals started providing telemedicine. So what happened is disruption. Here I'm talking about disruption in terms of disrupting consumers, or government, or regulatory environment, and the companies. It is not a new technology. It's not the disruption that came in. But with the tectonic shift, what, so what happens is a lot of times, the inertia is not necessarily an organizational inertia. The inertia could be a function of system, regulation, uh, customer apathy, and, and or it could be a combination of all. So in this case, it was always there. Everybody, it's telemedicine when it came, or video consultation when it came, it wasn't some breakthrough technology even for customers. Everybody knew it was there, right? It was not rocket science. Uh, and hospitals were there. Everybody rolled it out within one week. And, and the government was uh, this thing. So what I'm saying is uh, when this shift happens, and uh, it, it could be an external thing. Disruption can happen that way. And the, the, uh, all the stakeholders in the entire business ecosystem, industry ecosystem, can get you know, disrupted positively, negatively. I mean, this is a positive disruption. I'll give another positive disruption. Uh, I, I'll talk about, I talked about Inox, the multiplex industry. So in India, we're a movie crazy country. We love our Khans and Kapoor's and, uh, <laughs> and, and, and of course, in, in, in Rajni Khan's and sitting in Bangalore, I, I cannot not mention Dr. Rajkumar. So all the, so we are kind of really uh, you know, movie crazy country. Late 90s, uh, most of uh, the audience here wouldn't probably have been born. Late 90s, uh, the movie industry went into a decline, right? So the movie theaters, that the multiplexes were not there. Single theaters were there and it, was, it became rat infested. Uh, you couldn't get tickets. The new blockbuster, you have to buy ticket in black. So there were black marketers and you would, it was a very common scene and probably Srinivaska and, and uh, you know, Remnis, we, we would, would go there and a 10 buck ticket would cost 25 bucks because then there would be, uh, you know, in, in front of the cops standing there, there would be like, so there was no chance of getting those tickets. Uh, it used to be such a bad, uh, you know, scenario. Families stopped going to the movie theater. At the same time, the video revolution hit. Okay, so you started having video cassettes and CDs and people started, you know, again, there are two rounds of disruption. One, general decline, and the second, a new technology, which is home viewing. Okay, in a very rudimentary form, you got a VCR on rent and you got uh, three cassettes on rent and you watch three movies. You used to get it for 12 hours at a stretch. So you typically watch three movies at a stretch because you're trying to maximize your returns to the cost which you pay. So when the multiplex industry came and it actually revived, it revived to the extent that it almost, you know, to a large extent, most people still have the option of watching video at home, but they, they created an experience out of the entire thing, right? Um, single screens, incidentally, are almost dead. But what did the multiplex industry do? They just refurbished the customer experience around. So the disruption was in customer experience area. The core product of that screening a movie, it's a movie exhibition business, right? The core product of putting up a movie did not change. There's, there's no yeah. change, right? But what they did is they built up nice structures, nice theaters, pricey popcorn, some jazzy neon lights, nice sofas, 
And people think that because people saw value in that, families started coming in in, in, in droves. And, and the movie industry revived. Uh, you know, the quality of movies went up because more money flowed in, etc. So a lot of times it can also be because of how you embellish. So it may not be. So what it is, it is not a product innovation in this case. It is a process innovation or even more often experience innovation. As an industry, it didn't change the industry. Of course, now we are at the next inflection point of OTTs. So that we'll yeah. see how it plays out. Uh, you know, But uh, this is a very another, another example where huge disruption happened. And ha again, in a very positive way, revived one full industry uh, to that extent. So this, I, I thought I'll, I'll, I'll share uh, two, two of these instances. Back to you, Ben. Brilliant, brilliant. No, that's... Uh, did you want to say... No, 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 no. Just okay. clapping. Uh, <laughs> no, I, I, the, these are all brilliant examples um, because we tend to think of, dis of, of innovation as, as very high tech. And some of the really important innovation that we see is, is not so high tech. Um, I mean, I think like, you guys are living, we're all living in a very interesting time. And, you know, it's going to be fascinating to see what international airlines look like in yes, five years. Yes, yes, yes. Um, Probably the next two years, yes. Yeah. How does the travel <laughs> industry look like? I, I'm very interested to, a lot, got a lot of friends running travel companies and all, and do yeah. keep having chats and nobody has a clue. Yeah. Okay, well, they're, I, they're, they're I, talking about the uh, death of the breakfast buffet in hotels. I don't yeah. know how that plays out. So <laughs> we'll see. Well, that would be horrible in India. I love breakfast <laughs> breakfast buffets in hotels in India. Um, yeah, I, I my home is New Zealand, although I don't sound like it. And um, and you know, New Zealand is hugely the the economy is hugely dependent on international tourism. So they've been trying to, and, and it's actually been working. They've been getting, you know, they've, the government has tried to encourage, you know, people to have holidays locally, and it's it has been working. But it's not gonna it's not gonna keep going. You know, there aren't mm. that many places to see in New Zealand, um, so people are gonna run out, and our borders are completely closed, pretty much. So, um, so yeah, there we're it'll be very if we have this discussion in a year or two, it's. Uh, it'll be it'll be fascinating to to see what's happened, um, and and I love the example of of Nokia. I was I used to teach in Finland, and you know was sort of there when Nokia was just suddenly crashing and burning. And this is not just a phone company. This was a company that was very much at the you know very core to the essence of of the Finnish psyche. So it, it was more than just a company crashing and burning and. It was, you know, sort of. It it was such a big part of the of of Finnish pride that that it was it was it was it it affected the the nation in addition to having a really bad impact on the company. But what's interesting is what happened after that is you could see, you know, there were all these really smart, highly highly qualified technical people um, in Finland who were suddenly out of jobs, and the government. Um, started to put together, you know, they, they basically train people to, to be entrepreneurs. And so there's been an entire industry, you know, set of, entre well, an entre entrepreneurial spirit that's arisen that never would have shown up, I don't think, had, had Nokia not made some, in retrospect, really bad decisions. Um, so it's, it's, it's fascinating what, you know, there, as, as you, you're hearing, there are winners and losers in terms yeah. of, you know, when there's especially disruptive innovation. And so then it's a matter of what happens to support the losers, which is a bad term, um, to to reinvent themselves. Just to add to the Nokia yeah. example, I think what they missed out was that there was a shift from hardware to software in mobile phones. Mm -hmm. So I, I remember the entire focus was on uh, my first phone was a Nokia. Uh, and I have had the privilege of owning various Nokia phones, uh, including the brick. 5110, which you could hit people with. So what Nokia was trying to do is bring out newer and newer mobile phones. So there could be that flip thing and this is this. Flip so so the entire focus, the, the way Apple took it away from them is Apple redefined the business as a software business. So yeah. the hardware box 
they have fixed it. So even if you if you look at it today, you take ten phones sitting in a from people sitting in a room, different brands switched off. They look exactly the same, right? Mm. So yeah. what happened is the the entire game they moved from hardware to software. Nokia was so focused build being an engineering company and building great fabulous phones. Uh, that 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 the core business and how 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 the business itself was defined uh, had shifted under their feet. I remember that uh, you know CEO or chairman of Nokia who said oh, we did not do anything wrong. Uh, <laughs> he was very, but he failed to see. They failed to see that it it from a hardware game it became a software game. Yeah. Yes. Okay. And, and which is why today nobody wants to be a Nokia. Which is why you have these upgrades: iPhone 9, 10, 11, 12. One plus six, seven, eight, nine, ten. So they are continuously upgrading before, because Nokia is a big lesson. Like you said, losers also give very big lessons. Yeah, it yeah. is a lesson what not to do or how how to kick yourself constantly. So after that, so Nokia never had this concept of a variant of a phone, right? Yeah. It started by Apple, and now everybody has, uh, you know, sub brands. But all are every six months is a new version before anybody can. Add something else, so you are continuously disrupting yourself. Right? So yeah, I think absolutely. that that's a very very pertinent example that brought this. Yeah, I'll just extend your uh, um, so hardware to software uh, quote sort of uh, because to a certain extent I noticed that uh, Tesla has done the same thing for the car industry. Yeah. So the the way they upgrade the software of um, Tesla car. So while the vehicle is parked uh, overnight in the garage, overnight it has new capabilities, new features, and for free sort of, or they have fixed some glitches already overnight. Straight thing for a consumer, like, wow! What, my, my, <laughs> so the, See, so yeah, the, as it boils down, I think, to how you define your business. Yeah, yeah absolutely. How you define your business. So there's a very interesting example and oft quoted elsewhere, the ice factory example. Right. So yeah, in early yeah. 1900s, um, there was this ice business. So what would people do is people would stay near very cold cities, and uh, they would uh, in winters go to the lakes, cut, carry a sled and a horse, cut those ices, load it into um, you know those sleds and sell. And they were innovating. What was the innovation? The innovation was bigger horses, bigger sleds, faster or you know, sharper saws. Okay. After some you know, probably 30, 40 years of this thing, the central refrigeration plants came up, the factories, the ice factories. So that kind of totally disturbed because for them, the, 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 the ice cutters or the all, all these guys were thinking innovation in terms of the horse and the sled and uh, this thing. And, and the ice factory came up and then they kind of eliminated the business. Cut to another 40, 50 years later, refrigerators came up. So from an ice factory, people could make um, ice at home. So again, uh, this this bigger and better and more better supply chain of ice changed because it it um, you know um, uh, totally changed. So uh, depends on what the organization defines itself as. Uh, the uh, the ice cutters defined as we are in the ice cutting best business, right? But probably the entire thing was to provide people blocks of ice. So. It, it, it got, or, um, you know, micro pieces of ice at home. So the, the definition totally means, and it is very interesting to note that none of these ice sleds companies or whatever converted into the ice uh, factories. They were innovators and they were a different set of people. None of these ice factories made refrigerators. They were a different set of people, right? So depends on how you define the business you are in. And if you are able to define the business, uh, of of you know correctly, you will keep on innovating, right? So I think it is important to uh, have a clear definition of what you are doing uh, and the market you are operating on, right? Absolutely. Yeah, yeah and, and a broad definition. It's very easy to get stuck into the details mm -hmm. of what we do as individuals and as firms, rather than thinking about sort of what's the use. You know, what, what, how does the customers, you know, what, what, what service do we provide to the customer in a sense? And universities are running into this right now too. 
Yeah. You know, my university is very, it prides itself on the residential experience. Wow. And right now that's not looking like a very positive thing because um, <laughs> it's dangerous. <laughs> yeah. So it's it's been interesting in universities to see this mad scramble to to being able to provide a good educational experience online. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. some universities were better prepared to do it and are doing it much more effectively so uh, than others. So it's, this is very much a watch this space sort of <laughs> timing, I think. Okay, so we know that innovation is important. Um, how, what, if we think about organizing um, a firm, say, or or business to in order to facilitate innovation, especially disruptive innovation, um, is it better to have? Is it better set in an innovation department or unit, so that you've got a group that's tasked with innovation, thinking broadly and thinking of new stuff, or should this be broad based and diffused within the organization? Basically, should it be? The responsibility of a group of innovation specialists, or should it be part of everyone's job? What are your views on that? Uh, if I may take that, Srinivas, and then yeah, please, please go. Um, so, like I, I mentioned, I think uh, more than a department or a uh, function and all that, the first thing is to define what business are we. I think it's, it's important mm. because, and like Beth, you said that it has to be at a macro level, so that. Uh, you know, there is a very clear understanding and that tells you what, where to innovate and where not to innovate, right? Because you could have any innovation. Innovation is, is, is an issue of creativity, right? So you could have any kind of innovation. Will that, uh, like like in, in that uh, video we saw, will that be the next S curve, right? Or will it be not? How to decide that? I'll, I'll again cite a very interesting example. In the early days of my career, I was with, uh, in advertising, and I used to handle a work uh, client, a company called ITC, um, which is the India's largest tobacco cigarette maker. I mean, cigarettes were went such a bad uh, thing in those days. Uh, okay, so it, it is still India's one of the biggest uh, companies, probably a 70% of the market share in, in cigarettes. Um, and uh, so, uh, as, as the agency, we used to do it very, very intertwined uh, with the with the client side. So ITC was very worried, and this I'm talking about 1998. Uh, ITC was very, very worried that they knew that uh, cigarette bans were coming and what they they were calling dark markets. Right? So dark market means where you can't advertise. That those days you could still do surrogate, uh, but now obviously it is not there. You can't even put anything on the pack and all that. And and they were seeing the signs blow, and then they said, look, we need to diversify, right? So they had a hotels division, the Welcome Group Hotels, which is a good hotel, but uh, and, and they're very cash rich, obviously, uh, you know, having 70% of uh, India's large population and the cigarette market is, is means it's almost cash flow from that tap. So, uh, but business, what to do, what, how to disrupt yourself, it's easier said than done. So there was this, there's this uh, management thinker called Jean-Noël Caffre um, uh, from France. Uh, he has created something called the brand identity prism. He's one of the big brand identity uh, thinkers, gurus, etc. Um, so in, in fact, in, in, in when I was studying MBA, we studied his model. So IDC being the rich company it is, uh, they got Kefra on. And in, in Calcutta, in the Tolicons Club, uh, we were there for a two-day breakout. And at, you know, there was a lot of this, all the senior management, all the agencies, all the people who were working on the brand, so 50 people, including the uh, CEO of uh, IDC. So we were discussing and, and what was that? In, so are we in the cigarette business? Are we in this? Whatever. In the end of two days, right, is are fabulous, apart from Hindustan lever, uh, or levers, uh, Unilever, what do you call it now? Uh, they had a very good distribution system because cigarettes go to smaller villages, towns. Et so they defined themselves as we are a sales and distribution company. So we are a distribution company, not a cigarette mm -hmm. company. We are an FMCG distribution company anything that we can leverage to distribute we shall distribute then we got into other and then three four divisions started the foods business which is a very large uh, food business today uh, the the atas and dals and oil and etc it's a very very large chunk uh, the confectionery business okay 
which is the, the candy man and all that and the uh, bakery business at that point the biscuits and all and, and this was a large portfolio in fact i think uh, this year or last year they pipped levers as the largest fmcg player in india right. so they did that because they defined themselves as a distributor they said we have a damn good distribution chain right mm -hmm. so that's the strength and that is what we build upon if i if i am able to deliver cigarettes to the smallest retailer in uh, our small, smallest grocer in this village in interior India, and I deliver everything else, right? So, and and additionally, what they said is, look, my even the cigarette shops in India, which are these small kiosk shops, that's my channel, right? So I own the channel because ninety percent of the business is mine. Why should I let let other people get into that business? So though not core as a disruption, they also started the agarbatti or the incense stick business. And the matchbox business, because they're saying if people are buying cigarettes, they're buying matchboxes. It may not be very remunerative, but it is my channel. Why should I let Wipro or any other brand sell uh, matchboxes at, at, at this thing? The candy idea also came from the cigarette shop because there are candy jars kept, right? So they said, this is my channel, right? So, so when you define it, it's important to have clarity that what do what am I? So from a cigarette company, they moved into a distribution company. And today, cigarettes is a, you know it's still big, uh, but they have all their cash flows they have diverted and put it into businesses which have now are the big businesses in India. So how you disrupt yourself? And again, it is led by more from a, a, a perspective that ten years hence, fifteen years hence, you will not be allowed to market cigarettes and cigarettes is a very bad thing. Okay, so that you know, there's a disruption, a huge disruption. It's one of India's largest organizations. I've seen it. I, I was there in that session when they discussed what was so sufficient. I moved out, but I have seen that uh, you know that thought process. So that is clarity mm -hmm. of thought. That is what is important. Uh, if once you have clarity of thought, you can have ind independent teams. Obviously, it makes sense to have teams, and uh, it uh, probably more like startups within the organization, more like intrapreneurial. You know, internal entrepreneurs. <laughs> You can have small teams with senior leadership uh, looking at it. So that's one. Second, I was mentioning this uh, this pandemic-led thing. So we at NH, we have under, undertake, undertaken now a full digital transformation. Uh, what we are trying to do, because this kind of pushed us, and we are trying to say in future, and that's what we define for ourselves, that nobody will want to come to a hospital. So that's the definition is what we have put up, unless you have a surgery. Right? So we have... Put up a full, we have put up five, six senior guys uh, or from mid-level we have put in and created a team whose only job is to drive certain parts of the thing. Uh, we are putting in a chief transformation officer, right? And we, we are giving them these small, small areas and we say, run with it. Run a you know, home pharmacy delivery business. Run with a uh, you know, physiotherapy business. Run with a mental, we are at quaternary care surgical hospital. Right, we don't. These are ancillary services to it, but uh, mental health is the fastest growing area. And and in us, mm -hmm. in our system, being a surgical hospital, it's a very every uh, every one of our hospitals has a small uh, department. So we said, look, if this is growing, uh, can somebody build a mental health vertical? Can somebody build build uh, say um, somebody people undergoing dialysis? Can somebody build build a chronic care continuum kind of a program where where uh, you know you are cared through uh, all through the year rather than being transactional so we, uh, you know at an edge we are, we are doing huge transformation and uh, we, we recognize this problem so again led by the pandemic but the definition was very very clear that we believe and this is what we saw during the pandemic people were not coming to the hospital we said today there is a pandemic tomorrow there will be some other disruption so the underlying principle is people do not want to the hospital because it is scary. So whatever service they can avail at their home or the clinic next door or you know something in their community, they'll be happy to do. So hospitals will be there as the last resort, as for my surgery, etc. So that is how we have, you know, in the last couple of months we have we are totally redesigning the processes. Uh, we, we are saying uh, in, in terms of uh, the hospitals now in India, the processes you go in, fill a form, pay the money. Well, we are saying, please book the appointment, pay the money, and you get a 
thing on your WhatsApp or on your message saying the doctor is in room. Keep in number 22, floor number two. Your appointment is 11.30, please go there. Why do you need to talk to anybody else? Right? Yeah. So we are totally re reimagining the, how, how the, you know, the, the hospital of the future will be. And, and we are very conscious that if it doesn't, if we don't do it, somebody else will do it and put one thing next to us. Very clearly. Right? So from that perspective, I think uh, this is how the you know, larger change probably uh, is unfolding in terms of uh, smaller departments. But important thing is to get uh, the thing right that what business are we in? What do, what, where are we going? Yeah, it's about, it's, I think it's about understanding what is the core competence of the organization to go back to one of my mentors, CK Prahalad. <laughs> Sirvas. Yeah, so uh, in fact, uh, I would touch upon health example uh, also to drive home the point. In an organization, uh, the organization wants to drive the health, health of its employees. The health of uh, the employees uh, defines the health of the organization and uh, progress and growth and all that. So how do how how, how do we see that happening? Uh, it could be left to each employee's own fate. <laughs> Guys, if you are interested, go out and do something about it. Or uh, like as usual happens, uh, there is a gym uh, in the organization. Maybe there are uh, some TT tables uh, around the cafeteria and uh, maybe a golf uh, kit uh, outside in the garden uh, in the campus. So all this uh, paraphernalia and equipment could be arranged. But then uh, the key driver would be uh, the culture of the organization, exactly like uh, Sumanta was saying. So I think uh, if everybody is stuck to their own dark uh, cubicles, morning through night having all the equipment all that is just for uh, the jazz factor other than any specific this thing uh, sorry somebody needs to go on mute push back can you please let me see i, I can probably mute somebody. Uh, yeah okay yeah, good <laughs> um so uh, this is my belief that uh it, it needs to be a marriage uh, between the culture and also that culture driving each and every individual or employee of the organization to get the thing uh, into getting into these uh, new ideas and also the culture within the organization of failure is okay. See, out of 10 ideas, maybe all 10 will fail, but uh, with each failure, it's a good foundation where what not to do, where not to go. And uh, in fact, in a software, we have this uh, latest uh, or the off late newer uh, project methodology, implementation methodology is called Agile and DevOps. Okay, again, if this is French for you. <laughs> so th what it basically means is that fail early, fail early, fail fast because the later in the life cycle you fail, the more costly it's going to be. Yeah, so the earlier you fail, the lesser the damage. So in my language, Telugu, we have a saying actually. So, Antya Nishturam Kanna Adi Nishturam Melu. Means a disaster at the beginning is always much, much better than a disaster at the end. Okay. So I think that's about it actually. So that culture of uh, experimenting, not punishing somebody because uh, they failed, but rather uh, take that in the stride and go on. And employees get it that, yeah, I can take a risk. I can take a bet and try something new. And uh, if once, twice, thrice, they fail, fourth time, they learn. And as long as they don't repeat the same damn mistake, <laughs> <laughs> then that, that employee needs some... <laughs> I think uh, penalties. No, absolutely but true, Shrinivas. I mean, I, I think I, I totally resonate with you because uh, there's a very famous saying, or famous or not, but uh, there is a saying that uh, technology uh, doesn't bring disruption. People do. Right? So technology, yeah. word and disruption is overrated. It's ultimately technology on its own doesn't go and do any disruption. It is the yeah. people who use technology to bring disruption, or like I told about the multiplex industry, even if it's not a technology, so it's about the people. 
and for people to be able to disrupt and bring disruption uh, like you said culture has to be right and a culture of recognizing failure uh, honest intended failure and not like random failure uh, is very very important right because ultimately it will people who will do it right yeah. so yeah totally agree you guys are raising some incredibly important points um that I, it, one of the hardest things, I think, especially with a large company, is to get the culture right of the organization. And in my field in international business, we talk about a lot about national culture, but I actually believe that organizational culture is much more important. You know, national culture matters, but in terms of business, it's it's what the organization sets up, and it's you know, is is the organization encouraging employees to be entrepreneurial? No, very, very, very valid. Uh, sorry, I'll just interject here. No, no, uh, very valid point. I recently wrote a link to this that, um, you know, the importance of culture, because what is happening is I, I, I'm reading a lot of articles about the new normal and the work from home. If organizations were, if everybody was working from home, how do you build culture? And today, the days of USP and product difference is gone. These are wafer thin uh, wedges on which organizations are differentiating themselves. And it, yeah. in the service industry, it is the culture. Why do you choose a Marriott over a Hilton over a Taj? It's the culture. It's the training. How will that happen if you, uh, you know, if you're, if you're envisaging a future where everything is work from home? Just doesn't work because, you know, today what we are looking at is uh, people are going back into the growth path. It is not growth. It is maintenance. Uh, and mm -hmm. one of the few organizations which is growing, for example, Netflix today. Uh, Reed Hastings recently commented that uh, this is not working uh, because they are, they are one of the few companies who is actually growing, right, uh, in the pandemic. And, and he is feeling the struggle that uh, he said that our leadership and our people are multicultural, multi country. How do you that work? So he's saying, I'm waiting for the time when my entire staff gets vaccinated and they're back to work and then we can really think through new things. So culture is very, very important. And if you're not building the culture, uh, you know that's why that's why I'm very skeptical about the fact of the work from home being the new normal. Yes, mm -hmm. there will be flexibility, but it cannot be the new normal. See, when I I, I look go, we have around 24 hospitals in India and a couple of them outside. I travel three to four days a week, and I do my reviews at various hospitals. It is not that the technology is not there that you cannot do it, but the nuances, the when when you are talking, the body language, there are a lot of things which are unsaid. The how do you inspire people to do that? A lot of it is about inspiration. Most people know what, what to do. It's just about inspiring. On a Zoom call or on a WebEx call, how do you inspire people? I don't know if somebody's going to bring that disruption because I feel that, uh, you know, we will have to go back because we are humans, we are social animals. And culture is so, so important. And it is, it is not a lot of times given its due, but it is so, so important. Sorry, I just thought I'll uh, just like, I felt very passionately about it, so I just... Nope. <laughs> this, this is Absolutely. great. <laughs> Please. It's, it, it's interesting, especially now, you know, it's it's quite different whether you're part of it, you were part of an organization before the shutdown or whether you've come in new. I have one doctoral student who's just arrived in, in Leeds from overseas, and she's really struggling because she doesn't, she doesn't sort of have a culture to hook into for the university. Because she's only seen people on screens and very few of them. It's <laughs> it's very difficult. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But kind of organizational culture, I think, is a two-edged sword. You know, an organization that has a an, a culture of encouraging and uh, encouraging people to to contribute and be entrepreneurial and innovative is very different to an organization where you feel like you're just under the thumb. <laughs> Choose wisely, guys, when you're looking for for our audience to choose wisely when they're they're looking for for jobs it's not only about the salary um okay wow so you know yesterday we were worried how we were going to fill this two and a half hours we're having no <laughs> problem with this now let me figure out which is the the most important question um if we want to actually if we want to leave no let's do this um in your experience, what are some of the most difficult barriers to innovation? Yeah, so. Yeah, okay. 
and so it's uh, the feeling of security uh, i think sumanta had uh, mentioned earlier it's always important to feel that uh, insecure sort of so i hark back to my favorite author uh, alistair maclean so i am sure most of the most of you guys have watched some movies also where is their guns of never on and all those so uh, the great thing about this book says uh, the protagonist is as shit scared as anybody else about uh, his own life his or her own life actually okay but then uh, like I, i think one of the titles that uh, talks about itself uh, and the theme is fear is the key so the, the protagonist is as scared as the other guy about his own life and what happens next but then uh, executing it on that uh, wafer thin wedge and uh, coming out of it with control like i'm not i'm not in this game because i want to gain this a b c d i'm not uh, i'm here because this is the right thing to do and then you keep uh, yourself independent of the result so you are doing it because you are excited about it because it's the right thing to do and uh, you have this urge inside you that's uh, kicking you to go on and do it regardless of whether it makes money fame or uh, not because uh, that, that, that's who you are and uh, eventually eventually i think the world will catch up so it's for you as long as you are engaged in, in the whole thing i think uh, that, that, that's uh, that, so coming back to my original point so that uh, in fact edward de bono one of my favorite authors states this as the boiling frog syndrome meaning somebody very comfortable in their uh, present uh, situation uh, bo- boils to their death sort of whereas uh, the, they, they have this as that what the hell is happening and that uh, angst and thirst uh, and hunger for getting out of the rat and uh, the boredom they just jump out of the situation into the next curve so i think the be, being very secure is the worst thing to happen <laughs> uh, uh, for somebody sorry over to you sumanta no i think totally agree that uh, the mindset of the barrier is is a large barrier the mindset of insecurity so that is the obviously the primary one there's a second thing that at an organization level or an enterprise level uh, i feel uh, is very very important or is as a barrier is lack of communication a lot of times mm-hmm. transformation is led through uh, you know uh, top down and it causes tremendous in- insecurity amongst the rank, rank and file because they do not know they are not privy to those boardroom meetings where we have shown fancy escorts and all that and we have all convinced ourselves also in any organization there are thinkers and there are drones right the drones who come to their job go home now they are the ultimate delivery deliverers of the the, the change which you are talking about which you would have strategized in, in, a, in a boardroom if they are not taken on board and if they are not part of the co creation of this entire thing then it it it, it can go really uh, you know or and i'll give a certain example uh, i in my organization i look after also shared services so uh, we, like i mentioned we have 24 hospitals and um, we had these people calling up hospitals for appointments etc around 5 years back um, we started to put a set up a call centralized call center right in bangalore and which uh, where users would call the nearest hospital and if i'm in delhi and i'm calling the delhi hospital uh, the call gets uh, into the entire central booking engine now for one one and a half you no know, almost yeah almost a year there was tremendous resistance from the staff the front office staff and it was not an overt resistance right so um um and and i would be hearing from the team look this and and what would happen is typically in our in healthcare system doctors are the most important thing right so the their secretaries their staff were insecure about losing something to that virtual on the cloud call center they'll go and tell the doctor look you know the call center your patients are going away we can't do it. and the doctors would get agitated right look look this call center is bringing a or a patient chasing driving away patients and all and obviously in any system 1% will be error or half percent will be error right so 
and those would get very highlighted. So, and then, uh, you know, and it was going on for almost nine, 10 months. And, uh, you know, my team was coming and telling me, look, we are facing this problem, that problem. Then we set up a program where we set up a team who would go and meet individually doctors, individually the front office staff, explain what is the thing. Explain that, look, your job is not at risk. You are moving at a different set of the value chain. Whatever is the routine part, which is booking an appointment, is being done by the call center people. But if the patient has some more query, it is coming back to you because you have to be able to answer that query, which the call center agent may not be able to do. And you can spend more qualitative time doing that. So it, it took us almost another six, seven months to kind of get everybody on board. So I think this is sometimes, a lot of times underestimated that when you are doing transformation, of course, your mindset change. But people's insecurity because of lack of communication. So communication mm -hmm. is very, very important that, uh, you know, you over communicate. You say the same thing over and over and over and over again. Right. Uh, and then uh, till the time it becomes a truth. Right. So that's, I, I think, the second very, very important uh, thing that can really be a barrier to the sun. Fully, fully agreed. In fact, uh, in my job also, what we do is we walk into a country and uh, we change the banking system. We, I work for banks, so we change the IT architecture ecosystem of the bank. And uh, the first, one of the first things that's always done and ensured by these uh, banks for the success of the project is to get in all the uh, key stakeholders who are the tellers, cashiers, and in all the villages, towns, and cities of uh, the branches of that particular bank get in them and get them to buy in get them excited about the new oracle product but guys this is what you are going to get and then make them the how to say owners of this product so uh, in fact discuss with them what do you like about this maybe they don't like some of the things because in their country they do this stuff in this this way and they don't see that in this so we 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 get those demands from them and try to address as much as possible. And then suddenly, they, if uh, Beth has a demand that in New Zealand, guys, I, I do, I need this, this, this on the left. I, I need my uh, husband's photo on the left always. <laughs> Come what me and your product doesn't <laughs> allow that. If, if that is the ask, then maybe originally our product doesn't allow that. But then if we make some change, then suddenly, like, uh, Oh, I'm sure Beth will fight, will be the foot soldier and uh, marshal for our product uh, going forward. Sort of. And uh, imagine this happening for the practice of a country or that region. So it's uh, very, very important that uh, we get their buy-in. absolutely agree with uh, Sumanta that we get their buy-in and then uh, uh, make them our uh, messengers rather than us trying to push down something down their throats. Yeah, fully agree. Yeah, it, I would, it's it's interesting. This all goes around and comes around. Um, this this takes me back to when I was studying quality management and and you know the differences. I was in the auto industry in the U.S. in the 1970s, which was an interesting time to be there. Um, and you know, this was when Japanese firms were, which had a very different managerial mentality and organizational mentality. We're just doing so much better. So U.S. firms wanted to understand why, and they never quite got it. But um, Shanaz, I think is trying, yeah. has, has come in and wants us to go to Q and A. I suspect, right? Yeah. Uh, Yes, Professor Brett, it was very insightful to hear your personal anecdotes and interesting uh, examples from the industry. And uh, the participants have posted their questions as well. So uh, if you are OK with it, let's jump into it. Sounds yeah, great. Sure, sure. Yeah. Yeah. So there's one question from Senate. He asked that uh, in the new pandemic, uh, the companies are requesting the employees to work from home. They are even setting up the workspace. So do you think it's even possible or how uh, how will this work? So I have actually last year I went to a campus, uh, quite a few campuses and selected uh, some students to, who would join our organization this year. So last uh, uh, September, October, I was going across uh, to NITs across the country and uh, and uh, a couple of months back, all those kids joined our organization okay, and from their homes. So initial days, um, uh, 
we we had to do some troubleshooting for them to set their laptops in fact we shipped laptops across to their uh, residences where uh, they are across the country got them to install uh, certain tools like uh, zoom is our tool of choice sort of <laughs> webex so get, get their ids password uh, conveyed to them uh, teach them the nuances of how to use all the tools Uh, of the organization fall in line in terms of filling in weekly time sheets so these are all and uh, ethics and uh, all the um, uh, anti bribery anti corruption <laughs> and all this training to get this all behind them and so that they get something akin to the culture of the organization sort of so we, we, we did all that for a, i think uh, about two months actually so after the two months uh they have started uh, being part of the active projects now so yeah is it the same thing like for example last year the batch a bunch of guys who had come in we had them in a huge hall i myself had invited them ha ha welcome guys and we had a toast and a tea and coffee and it's not the same thing but uh, yeah yeah we, we try to make do sort of so it's not a how to say it's different it's not the same thing but then it's not a disaster it's not a disaster uh, and uh, there is always tomorrow when uh, we are also eagerly awaiting for the newbies to come and join us in the campus uh, actually yeah so that that's my uh, response so no, no, no need to take it in a very negative way so life goes on business goes on sorry over to you smata no, i think i agree i think we can go to the next question i Yeah. So, Mr. Uh, Rahul Siddharth asks, Tesla, Zomato, Apple, the disruptors were children uh, born out of booming economy, whereas white green revolution, submarines, radar, internet were born during wars and economic slumps. Disruption comes during economic boom, and innovation comes during economic slump. Is it a good assumption to make? i wouldn't think that's a fair assumption because like i mentioned it is a it can happen any time if you are defining disruption by an external black swan event then you can say yes pandemic or war disruption can be internal uh, it can be regulatory i mentioned the itc example it was a regulatory thing uh, i mentioned the uh, you know telemedicine example which is more uh, you know external environment a pandemic led Uh, it could be an organization choosing to redefine itself uh, in the video which we saw netflix has redefined itself from uh, the days when they were competing with blockbuster uh, so from video cassette to uh, or whatever dvd so it can be at any level i, I don't think it has to do with cycles uh, cycles may accelerate or decelerate it but innovations uh, are there uh like uh, for example in the fintech space or or uh, probably more in the fintech space but in general also a lot of these new startups uh if who are now big today many of them not all uh globally uh, have started around the year 2008 2009 so there's a presumption that a lot of guys lost their jobs or businesses uh, especially in the western countries uh in mm-hmm. 2008 and they were forced out of their comfort zone and they started something not because they wanted to but they were they didn't have a job many of them are like big entrepreneurs now so that's a shift which is kind of an external nudge uh, but having said that if somebody could build up because of a nudge instead of 2008 they would have started in 2012 right so it's a 3 4 year year the idea would have been there and they probably would have started and probably instead of 100 people 60 people would have started uh, so i, I do not yeah. think there is a uh, link only sometimes it, it gives a push Oh, Professor Beth, you want to add up? Uh, I don't think I can add anything to that. That was beautifully said. <laughs> uh, yeah, fully agree. Fully agree. Fully agree. yeah so uh, we can uh, jump to the next question and this is like uh, the recent disruption in the last decade started with a bank for example the uberization of various services but in order to be relevant they are providing the discounts which hits their unit economic so obviously they are not sustainable can we say that this uberization boom will burst will burst eventually i can take a stab at this um, so 
So only time will tell uh, if Uberization. In fact, Uber itself <laughs> where it will land. But uh, in my mind, uh, the most essential thing is for the new idea to come out and disrupt the established players. Okay, and uh, take any product, take any product which has uh, disrupted the industry. When it started off. It would have been in a very scrappy shape. It didn't have all the boxes taked. It didn't have all the bends and whistles. It uh, it eventually tuned up and uh, patched up, sort of. I'm sure when Uber started, it didn't have all the tie-ups with all the taxi walas in uh, all the towns uh, of uh, all the countries. So they started off and uh, with each learning experience, with each uh, hurdle. tune that patch that and over a period of time they became um, i mean uh, now it's a jargon uberization is a word used <laughs> across the globe sort of for that model sort of but then uh, it it's true that okay then uh, how, how uh, they, they are still making losses same for we work also that's also same situation they had pulled back their ipo recently so no profits without any profit just because of the uh number of hits they are getting will it sustain them that's a big question mark but i am hoping and uh, uh, i feel that they will uh, um, get better and better at the game rather than vanish into nothing which would be a shame in fact one excellent example again from uber is when they started off it was a uh, how to say a single ride okay but then over a period of time they started this uh, uber pool which is a shared right and if there were some individual taxi organizations which who had some hopes of uh, catching on with uber uh, economics they are they are slayed with uber pool like no way they are able to catch up with that uh, one third uh, one fourth cost of uber which were already very very low actually. so 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 uh, so again that, that's a disruption on top of a disruption sort of a uh, thing so i'm hoping uh, these things uh, will happen and stabilize at some mode where uh, they will eventually make profits because um, otherwise uh, it would not be a sustainable thing and they would have to unfortunately vanish into thin air sorry over to you samantha i have a slightly contrarian view on Okay. I think any disruption typically will have four stages, right? So you have idea, you have an execution, you have a scale up, and you have profitability. Mm-hmm. Because ultimately, uh, for the reason why any enterprise exists is to maximize shareholder value. In most cases, I'm talking about yes, uh, in the capitalist side of the universe. Uh, so when you are scaling up and when you are uh, trying to scale up by when uh, buying market share. it is all a lot of it is funded by easy vc money right and the larger context in the unfortunate thing is there is one role model everybody is trying to emulate which is amazon amazon lost money for 20 years and then they turn profitable but amazon to get into that level of disruption and to to do things uh at an operate people don't realize that when we talk about amazon that an operating level they were still making money it is only they were plowing back the money into the system to do new things that's where they were net negative but at the very operating level during the first couple of years amazon was never negative right the problem is that and the fact that jeff bezos was a private equity player okay is driving a lot of this hype in recent times you would have seen these two companies i'm forgetting which are these two names which one raised that 700 crore uh, capital and got sold to reliance for urban ladder uh, raised 700 crores and got sold at 120 crores somebody raised 400 crores got sold at 11 crores right so a a a a game of grabbing market share by the institutional price can only work when your unit level or the operating level profitability is there you can't lose money at the unit level and the profitability level and expect to scale up and burn more cash because you have got cash right so i feel very strongly that most of these will burn out unless there is a culture of profitability there are organizations who are building it slowly profit by profit 
it's not mm-hmm. that the entire probably 10 15% companies are making operating profits i'm not saying overall profit but for every day you need to pay the cost of delivering that service so if you if that that discipline is not there uh, you know and you're trying to just scaling up by yeah. buying market share uh, unless you have got unless you are reliance in india uh, which is doing this but of course being funded by their oil refinery in jamnagar which is uh, on one from one pipe pouring oil and one pipe pouring cash uh, so they are redeploying or like itc which would yeah, get yeah. into this thing because cigarettes were pouring cash unless you have that kind of a thing yeah, yeah. it is very very difficult and we'll see that now a lot of things will get accelerated with the pandemic we'll see the crashes now yeah, yeah. I, i am not sure though i will miss like you rightly said some of the products some of them are amazing products but they are just not sustainable Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, uh, like the the my personal lesson that I learned from or is listening to your uh, insightful anecdotes was to be uncomfortable when uh, when you're in a comfortable such a situation, right? So, uh, considering the pandemic, we <laughs> management students, uh, considering the pandemic, we management students are all are already in an uncomfortable situation. Now, how do we take an uncomfortable path? Because we tend to take the uh, comfortable path considering the job market right so uh, what will be your one advice to all the participants here <laughs> shall i take it shrivas yeah yeah please please come so uh, i i uh, there's a gentleman called tai fu li i don't know if you have heard of it i am a huge admirer of that person uh, he uh, uh, is a taiwan is american uh, studied at carnegie mellon he was one of the guys uh, who, who invented speech recognition and he is one of the foremost guys on ai in the world uh, having worked in apple uh, started microsoft china and uh, started then google china uh, before he had to shut it down and now is a venture capitalist called uh, based out of beijing and san francisco um, and runs a fund called sino vision fund so he's One of the few guys with a foot, one in China and one in the US, so understands both the markets. Very, very well recognized, and I would recommend you to see. So what he says is very, very interesting stuff. That AI is going to change the world. AI, and it is not sometime far in the future. AI is changing the world as we speak. When we are typing a mail on Gmail, it is using predictive text and it is telling you what the next word is going to be. AI is already there, and AI is going to change everything. only two jobs will remain or two kinds of jobs will remain right one which requires creativity one and the second which requires empathy right every other job sooner or later will be uh, gone to ai so in a doc when you go to a doctor right a uh, doctor tests you and looks at you and uh, you know our chairman in my organization is a very well known surgeon dr devi shetty Uh, and we, i was once having a discussion he said there are 35 parameters to look at when i am seeing a patient unfortunately because of the data i can i at best take a decision looking at 10 or 11 parameters human mind cannot process on real time 35 parameters right but it is all there i mean if if somebody goes through all those 35 parameters he'll give a better this thing so he all, he he has this vision that in future everything will be done by the machines the doctor will be there for empathy he'll be there to tell you look the surgery is okay this is that is a huge role i know we are underestimating that for example today people who are caregivers in in old age homes geriatric homes they are not paid much they are at the very low end of the healthcare scale in future probably it will be very very highly paid job because so that is one and second is creativity machines cannot be creative to the extent possible next 30 40 years doesn't look like they'll be amazing creative they are good at doing very repetitive tasks so remember these two things you have to work on these two dimensions of creativity and empathy if you are able to build these two dimensions all the jobs in future most of the jobs in future by the time we'll get into middle management will lie there about so it, it is very very important to look at 
yourself from that perspective that am I creative enough or am I in a business where I'm delivering enough empathy? Uh, a, so these, these are very, very two important. Uh, one thing uh, I think uh, uh, we, we re recently nowadays listen a lot about the rise of China. Essentially, what has China done? China has disrupted it. They have disrupted innovation. They have not really invented much of this stuff. Most of this stuff has been invented at the US and UK and European university labs, right? Even the current vaccines, be it Oxford, be it or all our university lab developments. But China has been able to move fast on this development and scale up and take it to market. That's the, so if you want to, so that is the other advice which I'll give you, that look at China. If you want to look at or understand from a career perspective, how quick small disruptions can make a large change. They have not done major changes. They have taken the change of the world and they have you know, done minor modifications and, and done fintech stuff and they have done payment on WeChat and Alipay and all these things are pretty, uh, you know, huge stuff they have done and then threatening the business of MasterCard and Visa. Uh, but most of these inventions are not Ch originally Chinese inventions, but they have been managed to innovate and disrupt. Right, because so it is important. So these are the two advices that you know have creativity, have empathy, or at least focus on that. And, and from a live lab project kind of a thing, look at Chan. Yes, yeah. So I, I will. Uh, I would go by the what uh, Dr. Himanshu Rai had uh, started off uh, in the inaugural session. He gave a very solid advice to everybody, I think, at all stages of life, and especially so for the MBA students, I think, which is, guys, uh, better uh, uh, late than never, uh, but then better earlier than late, sort of, which is, find the purpose of your life. I think it's a deep introspection uh, thing, sort of. He talked about his own aha moment or uh, epiphany moment on the Himalayas. <laughs> Uh, so th there cannot be a blanket strategy or mantra that works for each one of you. So everybody, each one has to oh, look into their and follow their hearts. And uh, I think only advice is that um, this is the time to do whatever you dream of. So whatever is your passion, follow your passion, follow your heart with time and your dedication and effort, the constraints and restraints will only vanish or overcome, sort of. Because uh, in the long run, all of us are dead, OK? No, no doubt about it. No doubt about it. There are no two thoughts about it. So we should not take uh, things too seriously, outcomes too seriously. Please uh, follow your heart, follow your passion. It will be a great life, and with the scale of uh, at which disruptions and markets are changing, it's going to be a very fast and exciting ride wherever you are uh, on the train or ski sort of. So get yourself, fasten your seat belts, and uh, just get headlong into it. Don't worry, be happy. So that that's my mantra, sort of. Yeah, I think it, it makes not work for you exactly the way you envisioned that it was going to look. But as you've yeah, heard yeah. from the three of us, when we were your age, none of us envisioned where we'd be now. So, you know, Absolutely. it's it's much more stark for you guys right now, but just whatever you're doing, make sure you can live with yourself and make sure you're, ha you're, you're getting satisfaction out of what you're doing. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, sir. Uh, we would always love to listen to more of uh, your conversations, but as good things tend to come to an end, and due to short of time, I uh, formally invite Professor Satinara Rentanara to uh, pro propose the vote of thanks. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Shanas. Thank uh, you, Shanas. It was a wonderful start for Athenium 2020 through a panel discussion on disruptive innovation. I take this opportunity to thank uh, Professor Beth. Mr. Srinivas Dagam and Mr. Sumanta Ray, on behalf of the director, faculty, and students of uh, the 36th and 37th batches of uh, BIM Trichy for the wonderful discourse on disruptive innovation. I'm sure all the audience would have uh, gained some insights in terms of taking examples from various industries that the uh, uh, panelists have touched upon. 
and uh, glad that uh, Beth was able to join from UK in the early hours of uh, uh, th th this particular day. Thank you very much, Beth, for that. And, oh, and, my pleasure. Uh, uh, thank you to uh, Srinivas and Sumantare for sharing your insights. Yeah, We look forward to more such interactions with uh, each one of you and uh, a pleasure uh, having you here for this conference. Thank you once again. Yeah. Thank you. Our pleasure. Thanks, Thanks. Thanks a lot. Thank you.